The thing that I value more than anything is three things. It is authenticity, it is transparency, and it is vulnerability. Appreciate you for being here. Let's get into the video. Welcome to another episode of the Rise Podcast. I'm Dave, and I'm joined with my very new friend, Richard. Richard and I met on Morgan Nelson's Dream Out Loud Method, a completely ridiculously amazing transformational weekend for us. And it's been awesome. great to be able to chew the fat before the start of the podcast. But man, thank you for being here. Welcome oh, along. Mate, thank you so much for Dave for having me, mate. I appreciate it. And uh, I know it was only like it was only like it was yesterday we were on that and that three day journey of the Dream Out Loud method. And it's it's been awesome. Met so many cool people through it. And even though I think when you do these kind of seminars, you walk away and things do fade away, but there's certain things that have still embedded in my brain that I think about every day. You yeah. Know? Which What's your biggest cool. takeaway? Is that stayed with you so far? I think the biggest thing is the way I've always looked at life in a different way. It's like people think, you know, I always look at a positive, but I think having those, you know, the blessings and be able to wake up in the morning and, and just having that bit of gratitude, writing those, you know, journaling a few things and, and saying a few things to yourself on that's really going to pump you up for the day. I think that's really important, you know? Yeah. Um, and we forget how lucky and grateful we both are. Like we're having kids, we're alive, we're happy, you know, we're, we're, there's so many people on the other side of the world that are, are going through tough times and, uh, and we're very fortunate. And I think there's never an excuse for anyone, you know, these days. Yeah, yeah I agree. I, um, I cannot believe the high level, the world-class level, if you will, of energy and, you know, implementation and everything that I've had since like going into rooms like that. Yeah. Are so damn important, yeah. you know, just to immerse yourself around like-minded individuals or, you know, you might not even find interest in any other aspect of life, but yeah. you're both committed to, you know, your own path and working on yourselves and becoming the best version of you possible. And, you know, like, Man, if honestly, if if that was the common theme that humanity came together on, the world would be a yeah. wonderful place. Oh, 100%. And yeah, and it's funny when you do, when you get out of things, something like that, or you go into other type of seminars, you walk away and you look at everyone, and you think, am I the only crazy one here? Am I the, you don't know, what what's going on? You know, because you do look at things in a very different way. You know, it's like um, the blinkers are off. Um, I've never really had blinkers on anyway, but you know, to a lot of people, it is the blinkers are off. You look at things very differently, and um, yeah, which is awesome. I, I honestly had such a great, great experience, and um, yeah, and I, I'd recommend people to do similar kind of courses everywhere. Honestly, I, I think it's, it's it's really important. Absolutely, yeah. I um, I just love how eclectic all the rooms are. You know, yeah. like no one's the same you know like yep. yeah you had luke and i who were the two personal trainer bodybuilder looking dudes but yeah. like you know everyone else we just had nothing and yeah. it's like we'll figure it out as we go you know our common theme is you know this intention of of becoming better at healing and you know all these sorts of things it's like that that's that you know that's humanity that's where yeah. humanity is at its best yeah no no 100 uh, percent. and how have you been going since you've done the, the course and have you done anything else as well. um yeah. i've just been head first into my business you know yep. scaling the rise um yep. you know like getting my name changed like there's been so much so much action taken which yeah. is really really cool because it's all super intentional like it's you know like it's all the things that i've written down over the years that went into that big blueprint that we're aiming towards you know like the thing that we put into a, our future on our timeline like taking action towards that stuff is just man like i was saying before we jumped on here is like I've been sick the last few weeks because I've been sending it so hard because it's like, I don't know. I feel so compelled, not just like motivated, you know, not just inspired. It's like, I have a compulsion to get this shit done and to, you know, to live my best life. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. You really, you know, where it's going to get to is just getting, doing all those things. You're so excited to get them done to get to that spot. You yeah. Know? Like, and because I'm an, like, I'm an excitable golden retriever as it is. Yeah. yeah. You know, like I just want to go. Yeah. I have to remember, slow down, take time, you know, breathe, be present, all that sort of stuff. Like so often I catch myself and I snap to it and I'm like, fuck, I'm not being present right now. Like I'm thinking about this thing, you know, months in advance or whatever it is. It's like, come on, present moment, present moment. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fantastic, man. And how's, how's the business going in, in your end? In- yeah, we're uh, doing well. Like I put a bit of pause on at the moment just to be able to take take stock of where I'm taking things. You know, like yeah. I got 
pulled in a few different directions with content ideas and, you know, people that I was working with um, as clients and stuff. And I just want to reevaluate a few things and a few standards for the way that I actually carry myself as a business, yeah. you know, business owner operator sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm working with a, a coaching company to be able to help, you know, scale things online and potentially hire some people and just, you know, put things in place, you know, leverage people and systems. Yeah. And um, because I need to step back, I need to do more of what we're doing now. I need to yeah. talk to more people. I need to do more high, you know, high level sort of stuff. Yeah. And being that I'm the biggest bottleneck of my business is just like so damn frustrating because you know yeah. you're the problem. Yeah. <laughs> but you're I also know. the biggest solution. You're the biggest. And the thing is, there's only so much time, you know, and 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 you know, as you know, you're burning out. And um, so it's just getting the key people. It's funny as we want to scale or get to where we want to go. Um, we go, we, we, in our heads, we're like, oh, I've got to do all these things. But and the funny thing is you end up, your circle ends up getting smaller of social circles and your circles and then other circles open up, different circles that never had before of like-minded people, key skills that you already know, but they're really good at it and they do it full time. So you want to, you want to focus on those. So, and, um, and I was always about, you know, doing that, like the tight ass special, like, oh man, I'm going to just do this and pay X amount of dollars to do that. But now I'm like, you know what? I would pay big dollars for someone that knows someone, something so well. And I'd talk to them for two hours to get the information out of them. Yep. Because I know instead of wasting time for weeks and weeks where these guys have done it. So and that, that's where we're really lucky because there is a plethora of people out there that are just awesome and they really want to help, you know? Um, but yeah, it's just... It just takes time to get that circle, build that trust, and and get people that are very like minded, like yourself, and, and yeah, for sure, the same direction, you know. Yeah. So, what does what does your business actually do? Like, what are the tentacles that you're weaving into now? Well, the thing is, I've been in education now for the last twenty years, um, focusing, and it started off with running a, a tattoo studio in Sydney uh, called Urban Steel. And it was like a piercing type of tattoo studio. We had like a barber shop. We were in, in start off in Glebe. And then within about a few years, we had nine shops, you know, and we grew like too quick, really, like too fast. And so long story short, we ended up imploding over, you know, six, seven years. But I learned so many lessons from it. And um, it learned me how to run a business. I had like 60 staff working for me at the time. And, and I did a piercing course with easy training as well back then to learn. And then later on down the track, I ended up becoming a part-time trainer. And, um, and then in the end, went through crazy time, went through a divorce, lost, lost everything, sold all the businesses, got out of everything. And I remember, you know, staying in a, in a rental home going, uh, um, the house I was renting going, what am I going to do? You know, my brother would come over and say, Rich, Let's go out, mate. I've got no money to go out anyway. I'm scared, you know. Um, it literally had to reset my life. And it wasn't just that. Like I was running another a company at the same time as well in a different, in, completely different industry, doing electronic installations for alarms and cameras for another 20 years. And um, so I gave all that away. I didn't like it. Got into the body art, got out of that, lost the house. And I remember the original owner for Easy Training rang me one day and said, look, Rich, I'm thinking about selling. Do you want to buy the business? And I'm like, I've got, I'm going to have my mum's for dinner tonight. That's how skinned I am. I said, I've got no money to buy a business. And, and in the end, she said to me, look, Rich, you're an awesome trainer. You've been working part-time. Do you want to take it over and just pay it off over a few years, you know, three, four years? And I said, you know what? I could probably do that. And that's, she gave me that lifeline. And since then, we were just a little business in Greensboro in melbourne you know and we started back in 1994 and now this year we've been around for 30 years and the girls jasmine that used to work for me back then is still with me she was only just turned 18 now she's got three kids and still works for me now so and her sister works for me her mum worked for me and it's it's like a little family our business is a little family you know but as you know educating is you, you are mentoring and that's what I wanted to focus more on and go, you know what, I love educating and I love working with a lot of these younger people and older people, but I really want to focus more now on helping them more with their lives, you know, not just a skill. I want to be able to do something that's going to transform their life. So focusing more on like coaching, 
Um, so, and so I partnered up with a gentleman called Anil Puri. He runs a business um, in the Blue Mountains where I live called uh, The Profit Coach. He's been a, a business coach for nearly 25 years. Hardcore. Like, you know, if you had to book him for an hour, you, you'd be paying him like 500 bucks an hour, you know. Um, so we just got together through someone else and we decided to join forces and set up a, a group called the Glam Growth Hub, where we're going to be like a, he uses he's focusing more on the coaching because that he's the expert in that, um and um and using and I'm going to focus more on mindset, you know, and um and work with people. I've got that 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 connection with a lot of these businesses. So we're going to work with body art businesses, people in the beauty and industry as well, because they're all anyone with a personal service industry uh, will fits in perfectly um, to the type of client that we want to look after. So yeah, so I've been working on that. I've been writing a couple of different books on on the you know trying to make money in a piercing or a tattoo shop. So um, yeah, I've been doing doing it for years now. We've trained so many people over the years. We've probably got about over you know nearly over ten thousand people over the years we've trained, and um, and we still I still have that passion. You know, I'm fifty three next month, and I still wake up in the morning, going go out, pinch myself, go how lucky I am. And when I'm in a class with all these newbies, I get so excited. I just can't wait. I always I just love seeing people succeed. And I just love that first day when they're so nervous. And, and then a year later, I'm talking to them and they started their own business and they're doing so well. It gets me really excited. And I feel proud of them. If like if they were like my kids. It's so weird. You know what I mean? So that's what I love seeing. And I genuinely love seeing people do well, you know, in all aspects of life, you know? Yeah. Man, I wish we had this conversation earlier when we were in person because this, like, hearing you talk about your passion and how much you, like, how high a priority you put on teaching and education and learning and, you know, self-development yeah. and stuff like that, like, it's the exact same as me. Yeah. It's the exact same. Like, when I wake up, you know, I'm at the gym by 5 a.m. Monday through to Friday. Yeah. I cannot wait like i'm a bit tired when i first wake up in the morning you know obviously waking up yeah. quarter past four but then the moment that my foot hits the ground i'm so damn excited it's like i get to help someone help themselves i get to help you know teach someone inspire someone i get to impart some of my hard lessons that i've learned through through this lens that you know people can just take and go holy shit like this is the thing that i've been looking for yeah yeah you know, like my life has been fucking hard don't get me wrong yeah. it's like it's been really challenging yeah but it has been the most amazing teacher. Yeah. And then I had kids and then yeah. it's become an even better teacher. Like yeah. unbelievable. I like, like I've won the lottery. Like I, I honestly cannot believe the life that I'm living yeah. with the woman that I'm going to be married to with my two beautiful children. Like it's unbelievable. It's fucking yeah. unbelievable. And I get to help other people build a life like I've built for myself. Yeah. And it's funny, you know, you say that because there are people out there in a similar situation like us that have kids, got a life, got an awesome job, but are still miserable. They wake up going, oh my God. And you know what it is? It's like they're embedded in a, it's embedded in their brain. They just cannot get rid of this shit that's blocking them and just throw it away and go, hey, okay, I've got rid of that. Now I can carry on, you know? Yeah. And and I, I've seen a lot of people like go, and they talk to me about their dramas. I'm like, what are you talking about, you buffet? You know what I mean? You are so lucky, you know? Some people have everything and they feel like they still don't have anything, you know? Uh, yeah, it, it's it's crazy. And as I think as we get older, you know, you look at it, you notice the days are going quicker, <laughs> really quick. Like, I was like, oh, my God, if you know, I'll be 55. And I'm thinking, oh, Oh, before you know, I'll be like seven years, I'll be 60. I'm like 60. Oh my God. And so now I'm following all these fitness pages of guys over 60. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, well, these guys are ripped. I got a chance even then to start working out, you know. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I think it's just I think it's hanging around with the right crowds, hanging around with the right energy of people. Uh, and even when you're down, everyone gets down. It's just the way it's life. We do have our days where we just like feel really flat. And and that's where you know you can give me a call uh, and I and, and I can help you with that or I can be the same. I can give you a call. There's I'm sure there's a handful of people that we could call that would give us a kick in the butt, you know. And that's really important. And a lot of these people don't have that. They end up hanging out with people 
that are in the same wavelength as them, you know, so they're not getting excited because they're just talking about the driven draft. I was talking to a friend about this the other day and he said to me, you know, Rich, you're right. I go after work, I meet up with a mate of mine. We go to the club and he's actually quite depressing. He talks to me about all this crap that does not going to affect my life. And he goes, so after our conversation with me, right, he's dropped this guy completely. He doesn't see him anymore. He said, it's not, it's actually, it's, it's, it's more, it's causing more of a depression in my life. I don't need it, you know? And that's what you got to do. You just got to go, you know, I don't need this. Just, and as we get older, we are, we are patients. We don't have any more patience. You know, we have patience to a certain extent, with certain things, but when it comes down to time, we just don't have it, you know? So people, and one of the scariest things that I see is people don't know how good things could be if they just, you know, got out of their way a little bit, just, just a tiny bit, you know, move from the, the known, like the known zone, the comfort zone, move out into that unknown the uncertainty, the because that's where life's exciting. And, you know, it just, they, they don't know what they don't know because they haven't experienced anything other than that. Yeah. And then, so they're wondering why they're in this, you know, unfulfilling relationship and, you know, shitty job or whatever it is. And they're going, yeah. how the fuck did I get here? It's because that's, that's all you've known. That's it. And they don't want to try something different because they're so set in their ways and it's kind of embedded in them. You know, it's like a, wearing an old sand shoe. You know, they're still stuck in that old sand shoe. And they don't want to give a new one because, oh, it's going to hurt a bit, you know, that kind of feeling. And that's what it is in life for them. They're yeah. just really comfort. They don't care if they got holes in it, man. They're still wearing them. <laughs> yeah, 100%. I've noticed a lot of people like suffer from uh, like a very silent denial. It's yeah. like, you know, as a very subtle gaslighting. Yeah. They're literally gaslighting their existence to say, no, things are fine. We don't need to change. Everything's all good. I don't like the partner that I've been sleeping next to for the last 15 years, but oh, well, we'll just keep going. Like yeah, yeah. So many people are caught into this paradigm of of just mediocrity where they just don't want they don't they don't know that they actually deserve more. They don't know that they're worth more than what they're settling for. You know, to settle is one of the worst things that you can do until you are a hundred percent congruent and happy with where you are. Yeah. 100%. You settle and you're a hundred percent happy, fantastic. Fuck yeah, you won yeah. the game. Oh mate, my old I was, you know, I'm divorced and in, in my last marriage, I I I, I was kind of settled. I was I went through that for a long period of my, I think probably the last 10, 10 years of that marriage, that last 10 years, that was a long, you know, I was together 24 years with my ex and that last 10 years was like, who am I? Who am I? This is another person. You know what I mean? We're just completely, just grow, especially when you meet someone young. So, and you do, you just settle and you just go with the flow and you end up being a big people pleaser. And, and you're not, if you looked at a picture of me from 20 years ago, you'd have a heart attack. You're like, who is that guy? You know what I mean? I feel younger than ever. People, you know, Richard, what's wrong with you? You're still like a bloody kid. And I said, I know, because I've always been a kid. And and I think you need to be, and and having kids, oh, my God. It, it makes me, sometimes I, I look at a photo of my daughter and and we had the latest daycare pictures. And I, and I looked at it and I just I literally cry with happiness because uh, I feel like I, I thought I'd never have kids because my ex-wife, we tried IVF nearly 10 times. And I thought I'd never have a kid. And then so at the age of, you know, 48, uh, having our first child was like, like unbelievable. I, I just still, I was so overwhelmed on that day when Lola was born. I was like, I still could, I still, even now to this day, even though she causes me so much grief and it's a pain in the ass, she, it just, uh, it, every time I see her, I just want to give her a hug and a kiss, you know, she's so sweet. Yeah. And I feel so lucky to be a dad to these amazing little kids. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Like one of the, th like one of my first, you know, big core pillar beliefs that I thought about myself and where the direction of my life was going. I created it when I was about 12 years old and I, I had this just profound, profound gnosis, like this deep embodied knowing I was like the best thing I'll ever do in my life is be a dad. Yeah. And like, I've been a dad a long time like my oldest is 10 and a half but yeah. before she was born i had a stepdaughter for you know 18 months yeah and so right. you know like i've been a dad for damn near 12 13 years yeah Plus, like this older you know older brother father figure sort of mentor in my job and like i love being a dad carrying yeah. that safe dad energy is so yeah. important yeah no it's really cool i hate changing nappies but that's another story but uh, uh rachel knows <laughs> Mate, Charlie, I'll tell you, he eats like a horse. And he's only three years old, but oh my God. He's a... 
Yeah, so we're going through uh, still the toilet training, which is which is very challenging. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's awesome. I, I get so excited when I see their bloody little faces, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and talking to Lola, Lola's like, so yesterday I said, oh, how was your day? She goes, oh, Kelsey, and she's got these two friends, Kelsey Taylor and Flora. And she's like, oh, Kelsey, he punched me yesterday. And, and they have these little fights. And I'm like, what'd you do? She goes, nothing. I still just hang out with them. You know, I just, I don't care. You know, I said, okay, cool. You know what I mean? She's so easygoing. And, uh, and that's what I love about it. Building that resilience and trying to build that, um, you know, self-esteem is so important to these young kids. Because when I was young, you know, I was off the boat. You know, I came to Australia when I was five years old. I'm Anglo-Indian. People don't know what the hell that is Anglo-Indian is. And I tell them, well, we all know who Freddie Mercury is. So Freddie Mercury is like my mom, you know, that nationality, you know. And um, and so I kind of, you know, and so Anglo-Indian, like we're a bit of a bitza. We brought up in India, but, you know, through British colonisation, um, we popped up, you know. So that's why my name is Richard Mark Anthony. And you know, I've got two Scottish grandfathers, you know, in the big <laughs> grandfathers. <laughs> and really brought up Catholic. And then coming to Australia when I was five, back in 1977, man, you know, people used to look at me and they thought I was Indigenous. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, a little Indigenous kid in our class, you know, living in the city. So it was really, really, it was hard. It's really challenging with, a, you know, with coloured skin growing up. So Bill, you build that resilience. But you didn't have anyone to talk to about it. Your, your parents at that time, were, they just work hard. They just work hard to put food on the table. Um, you know, interest rates are through the roof. It's a very challenging times for them as well. And, and my dad did two jobs forever. So my mum would be at home. She'd work and then, uh, and then yeah, have everything ready for us. And, and it was like really tough. You didn't have anyone to talk to. You know, I was the older sibling and my sister and my younger brother, Gavin, and, it, and now we're so lucky to be dads that actually communicate really well to our kids that our parents couldn't do. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's a completely different generation. And, and our kids are going to turn out so much, not better, but they're going to have a better mindset and how to deal with certain things a lot better than what we did because it's yeah. taken us years. And I, I was only just talking to someone about it yesterday that about when we leave school, you don't, we just get automated into what we need to do. Really, you never really know what we want to do. It's only when you're in your 40s, mid 40s to early 50s, that's what I am. I feel like now I know where my calling is. Isn't that strange? Yeah. I, like, it's it's funny that you mentioned that. Have you have you studied this, Think and Grow Rich? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So the story of um, how they get he, it's towards the end of the back of the book where he talks about a man doesn't hit his stride until he's in his 40s and 50s. Yeah. Like I'm 35 this year and yeah. the the version of me that is like who I've deliberately created right now is going to get dominated and decimated by me 5, 10, 15 years into the future just with the level of purpose and intention, like everything else that I am. Like yeah. where I am right now versus who I used to be, wildly different. Yeah. And who I get to be in the future as deliberate and intentional as I want to be, like that's up to me. That's so yeah. fucking cool. Yeah, being able to do that for our kids too, and go cool. Like you're, you know, I'm young. I'm a young dad. You know, like yeah. I had my oldest daughter when I was 25. Yeah, and that was kind of like an in, it, it was an unconscious intention of mine to be a young dad, so I didn't turn out like my shithead father. Yeah, and I, you know, been a dad for a long time, but going through that journey and having my daughter see the different versions of me, and then see me going to you know therapy and getting help and all these sorts of things. It doesn't cast that stereotypical, you know, like bullshit version of masculinity that's that's been portrayed for so long. Like yeah. the version of masculinity that I brought was brought up with, you know, was alcoholic. They used to bash women, like all these sorts of things. Yeah. It's not a great role model to see masculinity. Yeah. And then for my daughters to be able to see the different versions of me and then me apologizing for, you know, different awarenesses or perceptions or like me coming to terms with grief and guilt and stuff like that with them being open and transparent and having them to be able to learn that as safe masculinity is a super super important thing yeah yeah so that they have that clear-cut distinction it's like these are good world-class men you know these are elite men yeah and everyone else is just not up to standards yeah yeah no that's awesome no it's fantastic and because and and you, you know wait till you turn 40 you're gonna have like a shock all of a sudden, when you do turn 40, 
you are it's such a happy space because all this other stuff that causes a little bit of grief in our lives and it came down to i remember i used to dj when i was younger so i was one of these guys that always just did millions of things never went out drinking with guys well when i didn't have groups of guys to go out every weekend all my friends did that i never did that you know I would work, you know, I was a, I left school at year 10, became a, a, did an apprenticeship as a fitter machinist and, um, and did my trade for four years. And even before I even got my first license, I was already DJing. I had someone help me carry my DJ gear and I was DJing in private parties and ended up doing clubs. And back then it was like, I had this thing called a coffin where I had the turntables and the console. And it was like massive. It was like I was carrying a coffin around with milk crates of records. And, and I was like a little skinny dweeb dude, you know what I mean? Uh, that's why I think I've got bulging discs from back in the day. But, you know, doing all that hard work um, and then working during, and as an apprentice, I was earning, I think, 120 bucks a, a week. Can you believe it? And DJing, I was earning 150 bucks for five hours. I'm like, hey, I'll stick to DJing. So it was that journey of, of DJing, meeting different people and working hard, that work ethic, is um was so important to me you know and it is still now i just can't i can't sit still like you you always got to do something you know or we're always following the shiny ball you know <laughs> yeah uh, you know i've got one behind me actually <laughs> <Disco ball> behind <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah, how many of those shiny balls are unconscious to you though like, i know i know uh, are outside of your conscious awareness that yeah. are just being like puppeteered throughout your day and it's like hey go have a look at this thing you don't know why you're looking at this thing i know i know just go do it go read this book do this yeah, go read this book this thing yeah this thing that was in your memory from four weeks ago uh, that's been embedded at a deep unconscious level and it's made so many associations through your mind go follow that <laughs> yeah that's it yeah it's just really funny so yeah i think um yeah dj and going back to dj my story so yes yeah, so i dj this party it was a 40th and it was probably the oldest party i've ever done like 40th birthday oh i don't know that's kind of my god it was the best party i've ever been to not only dj it was the best party it was i played like disco the whole night and uh, i love disco music and and i love my hip-hop i love all different styles and but i played disco all night and i'm, and I'm looking god this crowd is so cool i was in my only early 20s at that time and i remember talking to one of the guys there and they said rich wait till you become 40 when you become 40 you are so comfortable with your body you don't care how you look you don't care what people think you don't give a shit about anything. You're just really, really happy when you turn 40. And I was like, that's awesome. And you know, the funny thing is when I did turn 40, I felt like that. I was like, yeah, I don't care. And then when you turn 50, you don't give a shit even more. It's it's crazy. But, you know, it's it's funny. But then that, that time, the clock of life is going so quick, you know. Um, and that's why you see old people getting up at bloody three in the morning and, and going to bed early so they can get up again and go hard again, you know, yep. with life. Um, so they've got this massive window of opportunity every day, you know. So for me now, it's buying, um, getting more time, no more money. Money will come with what you do, um, but it's having most the richest people in the world, all they want, they want just one time. Yeah. That's it. You know, isn't it crazy? They go all around the whole circle to get all this money so they can have make choices as well, good choices, and have time. And that's yeah. what I just want to have time while the kids are still young. Charlie's three, Lowell's five. I want to be able to, to be there, not like when my dad was never there because not he intentionally didn't want, not like he didn't want to be there. He wanted to be there, but he was doing juggling two jobs and he's doing whatever it takes for us to get us in school, you know? So, um, yeah, so you just can't wait to do that kind of stuff you know what i mean to be there for them not give them stuff they don't need stuff our kids are, you know we people just spoil kids with so much crap um they don't really appreciate it. all they want is just you they just want you and your time you yeah know? they want pure unaltered uninterrupted present time yeah no it's it. a couple of weeks ago i took lola for a drive we went up the central coast um and we were just chatting all the way up and it was just awesome just talking about just random stuff you know um, obviously she's yelling out are we there yet like every five seconds but other than that it's really cool uh, can i have my ipad no no ipad <laughs> so no it's awesome no i love it i actually love this time of my life i just need to get fitter and healthier you know yep. so that's that's my goal that's interesting. Did you um come up with like, did you start to get a little bit clearer on that when we were doing the wheel of life exercise? Um, 
I said to myself, I I want to be a machine. <laughs> I said that I want to be a machine. Okay, I haven't started the whole machine process yet, but th that's what one of my goals is to be a machine. When I'm in a machine, not like, like a like really ripped or anything, I just want to be healthy and fit, like just a healthy machine. That's it, you know, a well-oiled machine. Um, at the moment, I'm, I'm due for my, you know, 100,000, 200,000 service. So when I get that, get a sort of, get my body sorted out, I'll be ready ready to rock and roll you know i did a very similar thing from that weekend like my my big biggest areas of opportunity was around business and my relationship yeah. but like a third thing that i started questioning was around how do i want to look and perform yeah. um you know because like my obsession with jujitsu is real and current and it possesses my thoughts majority of the day and what made you get into it hey what made you get into jujitsu um funny enough it was watching I think it was UFC 194 with George St. Pierre versus Josh Koscheck. Mm -hmm. And at the time, uh, this is like late 2010, Josh was just mouthing off at everyone. Like, you know, he was a big, big personality. And I just thought he was an absolute wanker. Yeah. And then seeing George, the way that he carries himself and he's so professional and, you know, like he's a traditional martial artist and stuff like that. It was so inspiring for me. And then, um, like I started watching YouTube highlight reels of him and of his training and stuff like that and watching videos of him potentially like training at Henzo's in New York and, you know, all these other different places and just watching what jujitsu was. I was like, that's fucking sick. Yeah. When I get, when I get done with this bodybuilding thing, I'm going to yeah. do jujitsu. Yeah. So like, I didn't get finished with the bodybuilding shit until like 2017. And then I hurt my back, got injured, got fat, like, you know, out of shape, tried to go back to Muay Thai and that was horrible. And then um, March, 2021, that's where I was like, you know what? I'm pulling the trigger. I'm going to Jiu Jitsu. I'm not waiting any longer. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. All of my Muay Thai mates were like, like, what are you doing this for? Like, you would be much better off, like, you know, being around fighters. They're like, you'd be much better off doing Jiu Jitsu. You're a thinker. You're not a striker. Go, you know, go roll around on the floor with those people. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, I'll go give it a go. And when I gave it a go, it was just like, it was like, I was hooked straight away. It was like a zombie bit me and I became a zombie. This is funny. Like my brother just recently started and I'm always telling him, oh, you must get people's bums in your faces. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and he's like, yeah, it is. But he said, Rich, in like in 10 seconds, you they take so much energy out of you. It's, you learn so much. You don't realize how, you know, where you feel so weak when you're dealing with, and so he's been doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu now um, a couple of times a week and just loving it. He said, um, and Gavin's my brother, just more does traditional boxing and now he's doing Jiu Jitsu and just more for fitness. And he said for fitness, it's, it's a next level, next level fitness because it really grows your core and, and, um, and it's awesome. It's so much fun. So now his kids, he's got, he's got three boys and two of his boys are doing, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as well, so it's it's really cool, you know. Yeah. And I think it's all been growing up watching UFC and watching all this, even though like it's next level violence. Like you know, like some stuff's like I don't know how they could do it. You know what I mean? It's like crazy, but uh, but yeah, these guys are just like machines, absolute machines. You know. Yeah. The the cardio aspect is ridiculous. Like I've been an athlete all my life. Yeah. Even when I was overweight, I was still really athletic. Yeah. Um, and the, the cardio that I have now, I'm the fittest I've ever been at almost 35, yeah. like my proprioception and understanding of my body in space, whilst trying to manipulate or be manipulated by another human being is unparalleled. Yeah. Like my body awareness in space is ridiculous. Like I'll be upside down and I'll know exactly, you know, where to put my hand due to this. And that's the best thing I love about jujitsu is you get those brief brief moments in time of being in the flow state where yeah. you're just not conscious of anything and it's just happening all around you yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. like i've been in that state maybe three four times th yeah. this year maybe yeah. and you like you you want to it's like you want to clasp onto it and hold onto it because it's so fleeting yeah and that's one of the best things that i love is like it gives me space yeah. You know, like space to be able to think space to be able to process, you know, space to be able to bring my shadow out and allow it to come front and center and to see how fucking insignificant it is. Like I bring you here, like I'm in control of you. You don't like unconscious shadow processes. You don't get to show your face unless I let you out. Yeah. You know, like I'm not going to show up and, you know, be a little victim or sab self-sabotage or anything like that. It's like, I'm in control of me. This is my time now. Yeah. And then just, you know, like, 
understanding yourself from a physical perspective, I've always been a big dude, you know, like I've been a bodybuilder since I was what 18 first started going to the gym sort of thing. Yeah. I've done fighting before ex black belt and Taekwondo. Like, you know, I'm, I'm okay. Yeah. At the same time, I, when I was in my late twenties, starting to get into my thirties, I was like, can I actually defend myself against an attacker? Mm. And I started questioning whether any of my previous training plus being a big, you know, bodybuilder, if that matters. Yeah. And that's what got me back into Muay Thai because I was like, okay, with, you know, like 60 kilos extra body weight, let's see what it's like to get into a fight. Mm. Yeah, it's sparring and it's, you know, it's uh, a tamed version of it, but it's still contact. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, I'm getting punched in the face a lot. I'm probably not as good as, you know, I'm probably not as good as I used to be or I think that I used to be. And then, you know, the, the came along jujitsu. And I remember for the first probably six months of training, just getting fucking absolutely manhandled by absolutely everyone. Obviously, you know, you don't know anything. You're just this big oaf. Yeah. And then I remember rolling with, it was one of the purple belts. Rhea, it's actually her birthday today. Yeah. Um, she was uh, like halfway through a purple belt and she submitted me with the exact same triangle set up four times. Yeah, she well, armbarred me twice and um, I can't remember. She might've choked me from the back a few times as well. I'm pretty yeah. sure I submitted like eight times at least in that five minute round. Okay. And she looked at me and she's like, she's like, oh, you're good. You know, thank you for the role. And I was like, yeah, like I fucking love this. Yeah, and she yeah. goes, what do you mean? I was like, this is what, this is what I love about anything that you invest time, effort and energy into. It's like where you are as a beginner, you can see a crystal clear representation of someone who's about halfway versus like, you know, black belts and stuff like that. And to be able to see that transition, those like massive disparities is so inspiring to me. It's yeah. like, look how much I have to learn. Yeah. You know, and my my professor Fabio, he's been training jujitsu for like fuck, I think like thirty years, thirty five years, something like that. I'm I'm, I'm not, he's not that old. Sorry, Fabs. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, even he's constantly learning, and that's the thing. Like, he's you know fourth degree black belt, and he's like just constantly learning, constantly evolving, constantly just trying new things. So to see where I am now in year three versus year you know twenty five thirty sort of thing at Fabio is just oh like you can't complete it. You can't finish it. You can't perfect it. Yeah. And it makes you always have that little bit more. You're like, Oh, maybe if I do this next time, maybe if I try this, it's always ever evolving. And yeah. it's a deep obsession. If you can't understand yeah, that, yeah. my words. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, mate, I'll tell you, I'll tell you about my fight experiences or I've, I've, I've never been punched in the head in my life. I remember I've been, this is my closest thing I've ever gone to a fight. I was playing squash at school and you know when you got the upper level where the guys are looking at you and you're down there, and some guy wanted the court, and I said, "Mate, we've got another five minutes," and he called me every other name under the sun you can imagine, and I was like, "Man, you know, oh, I got so angry and so worked up that I said, that's it." And then as I'm walking, he's walking down the stairs, I'm walking right up, and I'm thinking in my head. What am I going to do? This guy's going to kick the shit out of me. <laughs> and we came up to each other. And I was like, I just, I just punched him in the gut. <laughs> and that was it. That was my fighting experience. I winded him and he walked away. And that was the end of it. But never in my life. So I've always kind of never been in a situation where there were, you know, anything, anything close to a fight. I always stay away. I think I'm a, you know, as I say, like a, a lover, not a fighter. <laughs> you know. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, it just intrigues me. But I, I, sometimes I, I do I, I did um, mixed martial arts years ago with a guy you probably know. His name is Anthony Perosh. Yep, He's got a little gym in Sydney, and they do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. But they had like a an exercise class, so my brother and I went into that, and and because my brother does boxing, you kind of you you're standing in front of everyone. They're in front of you. You're in front of them, and you move over and you punch, and you you know you spar for like. I don't know, two minutes and then you move on to the next person, you know? And this little kid came up to me, he was about 16 or 17. And I said, listen, man, don't punch me in the head. Just take it easy. You know, we're just here to, you know, my... and he kept on trying to punch me in the head. And, da, da. and then he went to my brother. My brother's like, he tried the same thing. My brother knocked him down. I said, listen, go watch out for this kid. <laughs> but I never had that, you know, it was like, it's, it's, I find it quite interesting. And I think one day I would love to do some type of martial arts more for my own, uh, you know, personal development on that side of things, you know, yeah. and to get that skill set uh, would be really cool because it's, it is like, a, it is a skill set. It's like going out in front, st st talking in front of stage to hundreds of thousands of people. 
that can be so scary. For me, that is just as scary as standing in front of someone that is going to do something to me. You know what I mean? Just so um, it'll be, be great to, not only that, as we get older, we've got kids to be able to defend, you know, with your family. You know, it's just it's just more for just self-awareness. You never want to, in the end of the day, you don't want to put yourself in that kind of situation, you know. And if you're with another hot-headed person with you, you, it's so easy to be put in that. So you look at, oh, God, I hate watching the news. You watch the news and there's always a shooting, a stabbing. You just got to look at someone the wrong way these days. You know what I mean? And, and if you've got that anger and you're already stressed, you're just going to cause, you just, you, something's going to happen and it's not going to be good. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And that's exactly why I started getting back into martial arts again. Yeah. I'm such an angry dude when I don't train. Yeah. Like my fuse is like, it's basically already lit. It just needs to be, you know, turned up to a hundred and it's going. Yeah. So I, str- I struggle with reactivity. Like yeah. I have to really keep myself in check and make sure that I'm, you know, responding, not reacting. Um, but like I've been punched in the face a bunch of times, like, and I probably should have been punched in the face a hell of a lot more considering, you know, how much of a dick I've been throughout my life. Like, you know, this is just the truth. Yeah. yeah. But these days, man, I'm so glad <laughs> again, I'm so glad I've matured. I'm so glad I'm turning 35. I don't put yeah. myself in shit situations anymore. Yeah. I, that being said, I still like to know that I have the ability to handle myself and anyone else around in just in case, you know, yeah. like you never know what's going on to yeah. have that in the back of your mind that you, you know, you got yourself covered and that if anything pops off, you can care, care for other people too. Like yeah. that's a pretty cool thing to know inside of yourself. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. So that's definitely on my to-do list on my, on my machine list. <laughs> Maybe we'll have a pocket. We'll have a chat in a year's time. We'll see, see how I eventuated from that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very much looking forward to, to that when you jump on the mats and you message me and you go, holy shit, Dave, what the fuck was that? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it. <laughs> that's like, that's one of my favorite, favorite things hearing out of people who go and try jujitsu. Um, you know, like I've got uh, someone that I used to work with um, at the, my last gym. They've started it and they're like, Dave, how do you enjoy this? Yeah, yeah. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. And I've competed in, you know, powerlifting and CrossFit and, you know, all the rest of the things. He's like, how do you enjoy this this sucks yeah like, well you know like it's challenging it's really fucking challenging but not only is it a physical challenge it's a mental challenge like it's a, it's a puzzle with another human being yeah. yeah yeah and being a thinker yourself rich like you'll be you'll be sitting there on the drive home no music just cruising along just going oh my god yeah. how did that asshole get me there yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that bloody bastard you know <laughs> and probably me i'd be like you know, a 15 year old kid, you know, so we see you about a hundred times, <laughs> you know, let's get the old guy. Let's get the yeah. Old guy. Yeah. Go, go see with the old guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that being said, you will have old guy strength. So you just like the moment that you hit like 50, you just get this uncanny extra strength. So. And everyone inside of like gyms and stuff like that knows it. The moment you yeah. see an old bloke come in, you're like, okay, watch out for his grips. He's going to, you know, he's going to have some very, <laughs> yeah. very strong hands. <laughs> I'm always well prepared for those grips. I, I always go for that. But the amount of times my wife will tell you, she will tell you if you got a bad, she'll tell you straight away. She was like, oh, okay, I'm not happy with that handshake. You know, you need to work work on that. Get harder, get in there, get in there, you know. And, and the old guys are really, it's like it's embedded in there because they've been working, dealing with other guys older than them back in the day that are really like, like have nearly broken their, their many fingers. So they're well prepared, you know, well versed in a good handshake, you know. Yeah. We, we're ready, mate. We're ready to rumble, you know. <laughs> Handshakes are, so, they're such a strange custom. Yeah. Like, this is probably going to sound really fucking autistic, but like I don't understand the purpose of the handshake. I understand the forearm shake because that's like um, that's showing that I don't have a weapon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This this is mutual. But going hand to hand, I I don't know how it evolved to that. Like it just it seems strange to me. You know, it's it's a real white thing. It's a white person <laughs> the handshake, isn't it? It's like it's like very executive business like thing that just goes on. I always hug people. I'm always a hugger. I'm always hugging everyone, you know? People are like, oh, take it easy. No, I'm hugging. And then I always kiss people randomly, like some kind of crazy European. But the other day I was kissing someone. I ended up kissing them in the head and their hair because they were a bit shorter. And then I went a second time around and kissed her in the hair again. I'm like, this is so weird. It must be so weird for them because I've just kissed them on the head <laughs> twice now. So, yeah, it's this awkward way of... Um, you know, acknowledging each other, you know what I mean? In that initial stage or when, that, when they're leaving. It's like, it is funny, isn't it? It's funny how 
it, how we react in those situations all the time. It's quite, actually quite comical when you see it when you, at events. Like sitting back and just observing humans is, yeah. without, without the filter of being a human. It's like, okay, if I'm witnessing something, what am I witnessing? And yeah. then breaking it down to like, you know, the each little steps in the, in the exchange, you know, it's like, person one steps up and they do this with their body and they're, you know, nodding up and down, big smile. And they're baring their teeth, but they seem friendly. Like all of the, if you break it down into the, like the really, really simplistic things, being a human's fucking weird. It is, mate. We're a bunch of oddballs, really a bunch of oddballs, you know, aliens will be looking at us going, what a bunch of freaks. What are they doing with themselves? You know? <laughs> yeah. Why are they letting people that are, you know, meant to be retired, living out their old age, you know, their twilight years, their golden years, yeah, they letting them like boss them around and make these things called laws and like what a strange thing you guys do. I know, I know, it's crazy. I, 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 it's going to be quite scary. The next generation, it's going to be weird because we're going to be old people one day looking back and going, "Oh my god, what are they doing now?" You know, it is so weird, mate. I'm still never going to get rid of my V8. You know, uh, so. <laughs> I'm so intrigued to see Gen X become like the people running the show. Yeah. I mean, that all the boomers die out and like, you know, retire, die out. Then Gen X steps up to the plate. Like y'all are just going to sit there and just be like, fuck this, figure it out yourselves. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> know. No, that's it. It's, it's going to be crazy. Oh my God. Like, can you um, imagine, like, Im imagine you and your, you know, like your peers and stuff like that going and being senators, prime ministers, you know, like, like world leaders, people that are working out foreign trade. Like, yeah. I think of that for my generation as a millennial and just go, yeah. nah, we're going to fuck this up and we're just yeah, going to yeah. pass it off to someone else. But uh, it's going to be our next generation. I reckon our kids are going to be in a very unique generation of kids. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Some of the, some of the empathy that yeah. I've seen come from, you know, kids under sort of 15 years old now. Yeah. It's amazing watching their beautiful little hearts just be so open and authentic because like that's kind of the society that we've created for them. It's like there's this beautiful container around love and compassion and equality. Like mm. let's let's keep that container sacred. Yeah. I got this young guy because I got a, a bad back helped me out with a car the other night. He came over to help me out and um and doing some work. And he was only he's only like 21 and he works at a real estate agent um during the day, three days a week. Then he does air task work for the other three days a week. And then he does other side jobs for other people. And including, he came and did work with me after work. Now, he's only like 21 years old, right? His dad's younger than me, a couple of years younger than me. And I just look at this work ethic this guy, this kid's got. It's absolutely amazing. He's got an awesome collection of cars that he owns, no loans. And just just amazing. I said, mate, you're, you're just absolutely awesome. And he's telling me him and his girlfriend are looking at buying a house now. And I'm like, my God, you guys are awesome. You know what I mean? It's like it's so cool to see these these young kids like develop so well. And it, and it's because the the parents, uh, uh, you know, like we are. I think even our generation want to really do the best for our kids, you know, and teach them. And I think it just, it really comes down to your your setting anyway at home. But uh, and it can be quite challenging to a lot of people. But I look at this guy and I go, wow, uh, this is so awesome. You know. And, uh, and I just love seeing young kids that have got ambition and got drive and and want to do so much for themselves and, um, and and then show that empathy and really want to help. And they can adapt to all different age levels. doesn't matter how young they are, you know? Mm. That's what I really love about it. I think it's really cool, you know? I, I love how open-minded everyone is in that younger generation too. Yeah. They're just so, like... They're coming at things from a different angle. Yeah. You know, like when I was a teenager, compassion was the furthest thing from my head. It was like, you know, let's let's go to fucking hardcore shows, like, you know, girls, parties, you know, getting high. Like that's what my mind was focusing on. I didn't yeah. give a fuck about anyone else. Neither did any of my friends. Yeah. Like we just did things. Yeah. But now, like it's ridiculous. The space that's held and, you know, the communication, the friendships, like it's, it's really interesting times that we're living through. It's... It, We'll we'll look back on this time in you know ten years time and go that was actually the revolution that kickstarted all of this. Mm. Yeah, hundred percent. I know. I, I wish I had sometimes. I look at life and I go, God, I wish I could get another twenty or thirty years. Or I wish I could rewind myself. You know. And so, but then I look at it. Everything that's happened to me over the years is is 
is made me who I am right now. And those experiences, uh, you know, a lot of good ones, a lot of bad ones, a lot of sad ones, um, you know, that have really changed me. When I lost my sister three years ago with cancer and then only dad not long ago as well, three, four months ago now. And, yeah, it's been really, really hard to deal with, you know. Um, but, you know, they're watching down on you and they're doing their own thing over there. They're happy. They're together now. So you just got to carry on. You can't just dwell on it because we're all going to die one day. It's just a matter of when and how. So um, I just wish I had more time, you know, to do more things. And and I look at, and I know my wife tells me, Richard, don't be an idiot. Because I always say, oh, God, I don't know if I'll be around when Lola eventually gets married. You know, I'll be like 90 years old. You know, that's it. If, if I survive that, you just don't know. And um, so there's things that even when I, the other day we went and had our wills done and I thought, I don't know if you've have, you ever done that. That's like, you don't realize that as you get older, it's something you got to do now. Anything could just happen anytime. When you got kids, you got to do your will. You know what I mean? So we did our will. And then I'm thinking to myself, shit, I've got to do all this shit. I've got to do all this shit prepared before, what do you mean when I'm dead. So I'm already worried about when I'm dead, how things are going to get done. So I'm here, I am allocating people in my life now so when i die so then rachel doesn't get stressed out i need you to sell my car stuff you're in charge of my vinyl collection you're otherwise rachel's gonna fucking just throw everything at the tip you know what I mean? yep. <laughs> that car's worth only two grand let's get rid of that you know so uh yeah so i got to get down so i'm worried about me myself on my tasks i'm gonna do when i'm dead so i'm big so i'm gonna have to plan on that so mate, it's never ending even when i'm dead i'm busy you know it's crazy <laughs> oh that's amazing there's so many ways that i want to go like there's so many little threads on what you just said yeah um when it comes to when it comes to thinking of yourself from you know like you got shit to do that you when you're dead you've even still got more left over yeah like <laughs> It's, it's, it's you, the thing that I'm thinking about is that it's so interesting. People think that you are yourself right now. Yeah. You're not yourself right now. You are, but you're yourself across time. Yeah. You're yourself in different lenses of awareness with different people. Like to, to have understanding of who you're going to become. Like my biggest goal in life is to be 110 years old. I want to see five generations of family underneath me. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's me, you know, bargaining with, I don't know, bargaining with whatever God governs time. Yeah. It's like, I'm bargaining with that to hope that I can get to 110 because I need to be able to purchase as much time now. Yeah. Like, please, dear God, let me have that experience because there's so much amazing shit in this playground for us to play with. Yeah, yeah. And how could you not? Yeah. How could you not? Like, there is there's so much, so much available to us. And can I tell you, isn't it funny how later in the years we realize this? Where in our younger years, time is nothing. It's like we just waste it. Yeah. Waste it dramatically by sleeping in or just sitting around or doing nothing. I'm like, what am I doing? You know what I mean? And now every every second of my day, even though some of it's like work related, but they work related, I enjoy. So it's like an enjoyment anyway. But every single second of my day is consumed with something or other, you know? Uh, and I love it. It's like, I never ever go, oh my God, I hate my job. I hate my life. I, I, mean, I never do that. You know? I couldn't imagine living like that. Like yeah. so, I've, I've been obsessed with what I'm doing. This is year 13. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. I couldn't imagine life any other way. You know, like before this, before PT and coaching and everything else that I did, I was a store manager of McDonald's. Yeah, And when I was there, I loved that. And I thought that I was going to do that. And, you know, like that was my shot at business because- like, How old were you then going, when you did- 21. 21. So yeah, I left, uh, left when I was 22. So when I was in year nine or year 10, I got a job at my Maccas. And can I tell you that that reference I got actually helped me get that apprenticeship from Maccas. Mm -hmm. that, because I always tell people, you know, they go, oh, Maccas is shit. Hey, Megan's awesome. Now, the only reason I did it because it was a girl I liked. I wanted to take to, um, like, to ask her for my year 10 formal. And I'll tell you the story briefly. Um, and so I thought I'd go to Macca's. And mate, in the end, I got to Macca's. I was in the fish station because they had, like, fish station and nugget station and apple pies in that little section. 
I was so skinny, but I would eat. I'm like about 100 fucking nuggets a day. I'll tell you now, every time I ship, I'm like knock over 100 because you could eat. There was no, you know, you didn't have to buy the food. You could eat, you know, whatever you wanted back then. But I would eat so many. I reckon they probably thought there was an issue with the stock takes because I used to eat so many nuggets. But I was so skinny. But, man, that girl didn't want to have a bar of me because my bloody, I got so many bloody pimples <laughs> from working at Macca's. <laughs> you know, the zits. You work at Macca's and you're a teenager, you're going to get zits, mate. And um, so that girl, that didn't happen. There was another girl I really liked. And this is what I had to do. She did jiu-jitsu, just plain old school jiu-jitsu. So I actually went and did the class only like four times just so I can ask her to the year 10 formal. And I finally, she accepted it and came to the year 10 formal with me. And it was an old LTD Ford Falcon and um, a stretched one, by the way, with a red, white with red leather interior. And I went with my mate, Joe Martinuzzo. And Joe lives up in Queensland now. And um, within five minutes of getting to our, you know, the grand ballroom at this event, I was so excited. Mate, she took off with some other guy within five minutes. I spent the whole bloody, you know, six months doing jiu-jitsu, <laughs> all this stuff, just to ask this girl on a date to go to my formal, and she literally dropped me within five minutes. So, yeah, not a good experience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Maccas, but Maccas, man, it was the best, you know. It's like it gave you such good uh, discipline in instructional methods and processes and and, and you get to meet a lot of people. Good to make you make some good friends at Maccas, you know. They had a very good culture and a good vibe, you know, yeah. in Maccas, I think. I loved, like loved my time at McDonald's. Yeah. Up, right up and right up until probably eight months before it ended, because that's when I transitioned from giving a shit about that into wanting to be a PT again. Yeah. And then so when they, you know, whatever happened, happened, I was like, all right, cool, I'm going this way now. And um like the whole time was fucking amazing. Like the being a manager was awesome. You met amazing new people. It, you know, taught me how to socialize. It taught me how to talk to people, you know, taught me leadership, taught me business practices. Like Maccas is such a perfect business that everything is calculated down to the second. And if something goes wrong, they have a manual that tells you exactly where to find what went wrong and how to rectify it. Yeah. Perfect. It's awesome. Like any business, that's why when Hungry Jacks first started, you know, they opened across the road from Maccas. They knew uh, if we do exactly what Maccas are doing, we're going to do well. And they did <laughs> because it was, you know, it's just the systems and processes and um, really make it today. And they're still, even though their Big Macs are so tiny, it really stresses me out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we look forward to on Thursday nights, we pick up the kids from daycare. They're, they, they're there for a long day. Go pick them up at six o'clock. So it's chippy nuggets and sauce every Thursday night for them. Yeah. So they get really excited. So, uh, and I get my 20 pack of nuggets. So I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, um, man, it's thank, thank you for bringing up th this around Mac is like, <laughs> I'm actually really nostalgic right now. I haven't yeah. thought fondly about those days in so long. Cause you can remember the times you can remember the different, the issues, the clients, the people, because I, I did it. I was only quite young, but they made me a little crew trainer. And so I was, I actually really enjoyed being a crew trainer, training all the young whippersnappers that came in, you know, okay, this is how many nuggets you can hide in your apron and you can eat them later. <laughs> how many apple pies you can scoff down. But, uh, but yeah, it was awesome. Honestly, it was, it was memorable times. It was really enjoyable times. And even though it doesn't matter what background you had, um, what life you had at home, what dramas. We all came, we all kind of worked in sync there. No matter what, if one of those cogs wasn't working, mate, everything falls apart. So everyone had to work in sync in Macca's, just how it is. Everything had to flow perfectly, you know? And when it didn't, mate, that person got a lot of grief, I'll tell you now. Yep. <laughs> so it's just how it was, isn't it? You know? Uh, and if, it, if it's for you, it's for you. And you need, it was like really fast paced. You don't realize how many think how many meals you turn over in a, in that shift and um and we were at a brand new maccas like they just opened and we were the, like the first staff so it kind of felt quite special because everything was new yeah but uh, but yeah i loved it i actually loved it and then you know working at maccas djing and school was making my mixtapes and taking me into the maccas and selling them at, the, at some of the staff yeah <laughs> it was really cool that's sick when i was um when i was at maccas 
like it gave me like I'm just you know thinking about how how it shaped me man to be a 21 year old store manager to go through to run you know essentially multi million dollar business have 65 staff members you know four other managers underneath you manage every single system know every single system inside and out every crew person like to have that as a foundation for my business experience when I was 21 yeah. I don't think I've ever been like in a place of gratitude for that I think yeah. I was like ah fucking mac is you know but now it's just interesting yeah you, you actually sometimes there's a really good book called the e myth you know try to find that the e myth it's a really oh um if you google it you'll see it it's um there's a, a couple of revisions of it now um but the i think the the, the author's i forgot his name something goober and um but really cool book and it's all about systems and processes and everything and it's all about the macas system and it doesn't matter what business you do, if you've got a system, like as we get older, our, our the way we want to run a business is very different to where like 20 years ago, how I wanted to run a business, you know? So now it's like running a business without me. That's my goal. Then running a business with a lot of people and staff because I've been there, done that, never do that again, you know? And even our minimal staff we've got now, it's just awesome. And we don't want to, the bigger you go, the bigger problems that you, that you end up having, you know? Um, and it, and if you've got a, a young family, then your business takes over your life because then it's all about money. It's about big money coming in, big money going out, and big headaches coming in, big headaches going out, you know, and it's just a just circle, this crazy cycle that you just don't want in your life. And um, as, as we get old, yeah, it changes. And so if you're in that process and want to grow a business, a lot of people have good systems, then the e -myth, this book is awesome about that, you know, helps you. Very similar. Like if you look at the Macca's system and you read the e -myth, you're like, oh my God, this is just like Macca's exactly, you know? And it teaches that same strategy in your life. It doesn't matter what you do. Because as you get old, it, it's funny because now you kind of think you want to build a business to sell a business, you know? You want to do these kind of things. You want to be able to um, make money without, and so you can have more time, you know? You want to, you're, it's not about how many hours you you do in a day anymore you know it's what's your worth you know and mm. go work, working hard as we all know is not going to get you anywhere it's just working that smarter and be able to work enough to be able to provide and have more time you know and that's why you know we get inspired by all these people we see online some of them have got fake ass lives you know we don't know what they're doing but on tick you see these guys they're like they, they are living their dream life some of them you know with their families living overseas working a few days a week and the rest of the time they're making enough money to be able to travel the world and 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 live in awesome places, you know. And for me, it's not the big, big houses and many cars. It's more about be able, to, be able to have more time with the kids to eventually travel. And I think traveling, honestly, is probably the most the best experience you could have for any human being is traveling around the world and meeting other people and looking at the way they live. You learn so much about cultures, languages religions everything you know what i mean it's just awesome and just opens your mind so when you come back home you feel so much more grateful and you have that so much gratitude of life and you just want to go wow and and i think when i went back to india in 94 to see where i was born and i met this one lady and i saw a beggar on the side of the street uh, it was only a young kid probably like eight years old and uh, begging standing there with their money you know with a hand out and they were there, man, I'll tell you now, all day. It was like in the medium strip. Now, this little kid had a little brother next to him, and this brother had no arms or no legs, just sitting there, you know. And that lady that, that was with told me that the parents actually did that to that child so they could, that child could help them make money for food. Can you believe it? You know, and it's like unbelievable. Now, that was back in 1994, and, I, and I, that picture, looking at that little kid, it's it's embedded in my brain all the time. It's just like there. doesn't matter what's happening in my life and what drama that's happening. can never compare to what this kid had to go through. And that kid had the biggest smile on their face because they, to them, they didn't know anything different. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so, yeah, those parents were so desperate to earn money that their second child, they chopped off their arms and legs just so they could be a beggar. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. You couldn't even think of that. Mm. You know? um, 
yeah but so that's it just gave me a that was a, a snap in my brain then when i saw that and i thought that's it nothing ever in my life is going to worry me you know when i saw that and that's it every day is like a money will come and go in everyone's lives and it's not the we we have to look at money is not uh, we can't just grab money and just go oh it made so much money i'll just have it on my bed and flutter and throw it in the air and have fun with it it's nothing money is nothing you know what i mean money is just something we need to to do certain things that's just to make the world around and to go around but all we want is enough money um and to have more time you know and i think and, and really appreciate the people we have around us that really do love us um and and that's that's what counts i think the most you know and what made you click so when you finished school what did you do when you finished school what were you I, I so I started at Mackers in grade eleven, yeah. um, and then yeah, I went all the way until I was twenty two, and yeah. so that was pretty much I fell straight into that. I had a few other jobs working in. Um, I worked at like Platinum Nightclub when I was um, a teenager as well. That was fun. That's at Gold Coast. Uh, yeah, yeah I really uh, the now, or that whole Nikon Plaza is demolished now. Yeah, crazy. Oh, wow. Um, so then like I had a few other jobs and you know did some other stuff. And um, let's, yeah, like, but in year 11, while I was working at Macca's, I never thought oh, I'll become a store manager. I'll take it that way. I was like, we did a career expo um, at Bond University and yeah. we're walking around. I see this booth that says AIF, Australian Institute of Fitness. And, yeah. um, you know, this is when the fitness boom was kicking off and it was, everyone was going nuts. And um, I was like, what, what do you guys do? What do you guys teach? And they're like, oh, we teach people how to be personal trainers. I was like, what is a personal trainer? And like, yeah. oh, you get paid to be able to teach people how to exercise and eat well and, you know, to stay fit and healthy. And I was like, you can get paid to do that. And they go, yeah, and you can be your own boss. I was like, obviously I'm going to do this. Yeah. You know, like it was just a no brainer decision. You know, the same yeah. thing that I said before about, you know, being a dad, like it was like, yeah, obviously I'm going to be a personal trainer. I can get paid, be my own boss, set my own hours, earn what the fuck I want to earn with the level of effort that I put in. Sure, let's go. Yeah. And yeah. then um, so when Mac is fell through, I was like, okay, well, I'll go back down this path. Yeah. It, was a, it was a no brainer for me. You know, I love fitness. I love bodybuilding, you know, like Superman, Goku, like all, you know, strong uh, masculine role models for me. That's like, yeah, you're going to train. You're going to do martial arts. Like, obviously, this is a path forward for you. Yeah, yeah. Like, the, the biggest no-brainer of my life outside of being a dad. Right. I love the fitness industry because I love the transformations. I love this person being so big or so teeny, and then all of a sudden, they're, like, super fit and ripped here. I'm like, oh, my God, I love that transformation. I just love trans. You know what else I love? I'm addicted to watching on TikTok is these guys that do these extreme diets. Like, the guy that will just drink water for 20 days straight, you know, and he's still talking about it. I'm on day 14 now, just drinking water. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, it's so depressing. Go and eat something, you bastard. But he's just doing it for TikTok. But it's awesome to watch. <laughs> you know what I mean? Things you do to get followers. But, but it's, it's so weird cool. how like that has become a, I don't know, an income stream. Is yeah. do weird shit for people on the internet that, you know, you build up a big enough following and all of a sudden you can earn a livable wage. And what are the guy that ate Maccas for I don't know how long? And he died not long ago. Oh, did he? Yeah. You know, yeah, right. Big Mac Me. Or what, what was that? There was a movie on it. And uh, Super Size Me. Super Size Me. Yeah. So that guy died, the director of that. You know? Yeah, right. Yeah. So, poor bugger. Well, it didn't work out well eating all those bloody. Well, you know, they found, remember, they found a cheeseburger that, or they put it up like from 20 years ago and they opened it up and it looked yep. and it's still the same still, hasn't still decayed. The same. Yep. <laughs> there's a lot for our food man like I know. that's what we call you know like fast food yeah man yeah the the whole food industry is weird you know like as, i mean i'm so thankful again so thankful for what we've got and that we're not america with all their fake bullshit yeah. but like food's just not food anymore it isn't i my brother and i had a restaurant we opened up for the first time um, just before COVID, called the Anthony Brothers. I'm, I'm actually wearing my uh, Anthony Brothers hoodie. Yeah, nice. And um, it was we wanted to open up like a cigar lounge. It was always a dream. We opened up in the Blue Mountains, and because I love the vibe, it was like a very rock and roll kind of bar. So we had like um, really cool bands with their big basses, like Stray Cat style, like rockabilly music, Johnny Cash. So every week, every weekend, we had like live bands. We had an awesome, cool bar, and. Um, and then what really surprised me was the food side of it. Because when we were ordering food, 
like the chef would go, yeah, we need all this. And then we saw it all come in. And I'm like, all this stuff is so processed. And these are the ingredients that are actually going in normal comfort food meals, you know, that you think that were just fresh. They weren't. All this stuff you buy is just everything is hardcore processed. Everything is bulk processed crap. There was nothing actually really cool. You know what I mean? Um, and I, I just thought to myself, oh, my God, there's nothing's ever real these days, you know, unless you're – I've got a friend of mine that's into uh, going out and shooting for deer. Uh, he's been shooting out for a while. He hasn't got any deer. I said, mate, the deers can see your stupid bowing arrows come at you, and they really run off. <laughs> you know, he's, he's had no luck freezing his booty off at night trying to get deer. But he said, Rich, that is the best way to eat because when I did eventually catch one, that would last us for months at home, you know? And it was just like really fresh and real. And what we are getting, you know, with, with meats and how they put dye in their meats and all this kind of stuff. Isn't it crazy? Don't you think it's like... I, I don't know how we got here. Yeah. Like it seems like civilization peaked sort of around the, what, the 90s was a pretty good fucking era. Yeah. And then it's just become this weird facsimile. It's like it's a copy of a copy of yeah. reality. Yeah. You know, people's fake, technology's fake, media's fake, food's fake, air's fake. Like there's, you know, bugger all soil left. So we're going to have to create fake soil. Like everything's just, it's a it's a, a carbon copy of the original. Right and then like going back to what we were talking about with our kids, I don't see that with them though. They're so yeah. real and authentic that, you know, like they are as they are and they, you know, they tell it how it comes. Yeah. Like well, my, my, my youngest one, holy shit. That child, she's just like, She's as straight as an arrow and just goes, Dad, bang. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, talking about fake stuff, I'm buying some fake grass tomorrow to put around my shed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, grass won't grow. So I just want to admit it to everyone. I am buying some fake grass. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. But uh, yeah, no, it's crazy. And then even now, like with electric cars and they were talking about, uh, you know, the, how they make Teslas. <laughs> Look at the factories, the amount of stuff, the, what's involved in making a Tesla battery. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, that completely crosses it off, <laughs> helping anything, anyone, you know? Uh, yeah, so. Oh. Yeah, again, this is the revolution. We're living through it. Yeah. It's being live streamed around the world and people would just, you know, have no idea what's actually going on. We don't know what's going on. Yeah. It's like, oh, we're we're approximating somewhere. It's like there's kind of there's kind of like a convergence of things. We're kind of aiming at something as civilization. Yeah. Who knows what it is? It's going to be technology based because everyone's glued to it, and we're creating this, you know, new AI constantly evolving every single day. Yeah. Who knows where we're aiming towards? But something's coming to a head. Something's going to come to a head, and it'll happen in our lifetime for sure. Something yeah. crazy, some crazy shit's going to happen. Just going to put it out there. I want aliens. Yeah, aliens would be awesome. I that always aliens, aliens and zombies aliens. would be cool. Like Rachel and I, we always work at a plan of where we're going to hide, on what type of like uh, weapons we're going to have prepared just in case there's some type of aliens. Like the other day, watching that movie, A yeah, Quiet Place. Oh yep, God. one of the best know. movies ever. Ever, isn't it? Yep. The first one. We're going to watch the second one tonight, actually, being Friday night. And uh, and even though we've seen it like four times, we love it. But yeah, it's one of the best movies. It is like crazy, crazy. We want something like that to happen. We want something crazy. We want an alien to come in and do something weird. We want to put the TV on and go, oh my God, <laughs> you know, something happened. Yeah. Obviously, I'm not praying for people, you know, die, but just something cool, like an alien, you know? Honestly, like with like looking at things from opposites, you see what pop cultures put out, you know, sci-fi and stuff like that. It's all these like bad aliens, malevolent, you know, enslaved humanity, all that kind of crap. I guarantee you that like majority of what is out there, if anything's out there, is not going to be that advanced as a species that they can go through space or interdimensional travel, that they care about oppression, that yeah. like they're going to be benevolent. They're going to be evolved. And they're going to come up and go, all right, you fucking idiots. Here you go. This is what you need. Like come together. You're all the fucking same. Like yeah. there you go, go back into the play pen, and then they'll piss off and leave us going. What, what the happened? fuck just happened? Yeah. Yeah. hundred <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. percent. Imagine being that evolved that you can travel through space or dimensions or whatever the fuck they're doing and go, Oh yeah, we're here to enslave you. You yeah. know, it's a probe you with like, 
It's not going to happen. It's definitely not going to happen. Yeah. But, you know, if we looked at aliens, what type of aliens would you like to attack? Would it be like Sigourney Weaver style aliens or which aliens? Oh. I'd go with some Ewoks. Ewoks? Oh, yeah, I could go with some Ewoks. Yeah, Ewoks would be pretty cool. Because they're fun. They're a nice little friendly. They don't, they're too vicious, you know? Um, but yeah, no, yeah, no, no Sigourney Weaver aliens because no, we'd, be, we'd, be, God, no. we'd be gone. <laughs> Especially the big mama. No, thank you. Oh, no big mamas. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. those movies scared the shit out of me that much when I was a kid. I'm pretty sure I've only seen each of the alien movies once. Yeah, oh, you know, we love it. Rachel was so was- damn good. We've still got the, like, she's got the series on DVD. Like, we're the box section. Even though we've got the selection of DVDs we never, ever look at, ever. It's yeah. like my vinyl and CD collection is massive. But everything's, who uses it anymore? You know, we're just always using, you know, like, uh, everything's on Spotify these days, isn't it? Yeah, everything's on Spotify or Netflix or, yeah. you know, that's pretty much it. Oh, it's, it's crazy. Uh, oh, sorry, my well, camera's going all over the place. Um <laughs> Yeah, it's just a different world, mate. Different world we live in now. And, and what's like, your next step? What's your next? What's your next big plan? Oh, one thing I want to ask you: NLP. Mm. You use. I just recently did a course in it, and and I'm still going through the assignment process of it. And I don't. It was being on Zoom. It wasn't that great, you know. I found. Yeah. Um, but there was about 150 people on the course, and so it was quite hard to to engage. A lot of interruptions you know how it is you know it's hard enough in a room let alone on zoom mm. on 10 to 12 hours a day for, for five days you know it was pretty intense how do you how do you use nlp in, in into your work how's that in your life now? i use it in everything that i do yeah yeah everything yeah. my linguistics are deliberate when i'm on so right now i've using some NLP techniques like anchoring to be able to put myself in state. If you notice my speech is completely changed because this is the state that I use. Yeah. It used to be a very unconscious thing that uh, when you do NLP and if it's done correctly, the way that the unconscious is opened up and it steps down in to be able to deep seed all the suggestions and like put everything in properly so that you can use those resources front and center whenever you need them. They have to be done in person with someone who's well-trained to be able to hold space of like group hypnosis. Yeah. In my opinion, if you're doing an online NLP or hypnosis um, training course, it's not going to give you the same, uh, same outcome as doing it in person. Yeah. hundred so percent. Because I use it every single day and like, I use it deliberately every single day. Yeah, That's because it was installed into my unconscious and we used it and drilled it over and over and over and over and over to make sure that we knew it at a deep unconscious level. Then it can become like consciously used um, as well. Majority yeah. of the time, if you're NLP trained, you're using linguistics with people, whether you like it or not unconsciously. Yeah. If yeah. you're not, you know, you're not aware, you're not an intellectual, you don't study yourself and the way you think, feel and act you're using NLP consistently with everyone that you, um, that you meet, that you talk to. Yeah. 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 No, it's, all, it's like, just I, a shame that there's so many NLP trainings that are happening online. Oh, hundred percent. And I, I look, I did it more to, to learn about it, not to actually practice it. Like there's little things I, uh, you, you know, I took from it, but it's because we want to have, we want to actually install these courses and get like the best in Australia to deliver them, you know, um, at, on our training. So, because I want to start, creating courses now more about um, self-help and to be able to transform your life. So that's what I'm hitting. I want to be able to do things that can transform people's lives. That's, that's my goal, you know? So, you and me both, brother. Yeah. So um, I'm excited about it, you know, and there's, there's more of us out there. It's even better, you know? Absolutely. And the, the thing is more and more people are waking up to, you know, like they're just waking up in general. They're waking up to the things that they don't want and they're going to be reaching out to people like you and me to be able to go, I don't know what's going wrong in my life. I'm sick of it. I need help. Yeah, yeah. You know, you seem pretty happy. You seem like you've got, you know, your life under under control and where you want to be. Like, teach me. Yeah. Because oh, that was that's what I said when I first started down this rabbit hole. I was like, I fucking hate everything about who I am and what my life is doing right now. There's a few things I like. The rest of it, I want to change. I don't know how. I don't even know if it's possible. Help. Yeah. And my, one of my mates turned around to me and he goes, yeah, you come to the right place. You need to go do this course, read these books and do this, blah, 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 blah. And he goes, then you'll be fine. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it's like, I got steered in the right direction. Thanks to yeah. podcasts like mine and what you're doing and everything like that. We have the ability to connect with more people that are like, fuck, I didn't even know that's the thing I'm looking for. Yeah. 
Yeah, isn't it crazy? And I think that's what having these um, um, outlets, you know, like socials and like TikTok and, you know, all the stuff we're doing through the podcast, you know, there are people out there that actually really want to listen to us and want to hear the stuff that we're talking about mm. because in their normal circles, they wouldn't, you know, and listening to TV, they wouldn't, you know, um, because a lot of it's all just rubbish. You know, you just want to, they want to listen to people that are true to themselves and are real. And that's what it comes down to because there is so much fake ass stuff out there in the yeah. world. And, um, and yeah, they want to meet people with integrity and, um, and, and got the right values out there. You know, I think that's really important. hundred percent. Like what you said there, they're, they're seeking for real, mm. you know, anything that their phone can give them is going to be a small glimpse of reality. Whereas mm. they're looking for something that's actual, you know, real human connection, real human communication, something that has substance to it, something that has meaning and depth. Yeah. You know, like the, the real is what matters in life. Connections, what matters. Yeah. hundred percent. No, it's fantastic, man. I'm, I'm excited for, I'm excited for you and your journey, you know? Oh, yeah. I'll look forward to catching up more in the future, my man. Yeah, I think we'll, um, let's do another one in a, I don't know, a couple, three, four months and see where things are going. Even if it's not through a podcast, we just chew the fat anyway, you know? Yeah, catch up Absolutely. Anyway, you know? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. We will see you next week. Thanks. You're a legend, Dave. Us. Thank you for having me, my friend. I really appreciate it, you know? I look forward to it again. Oh, yeah. See you guys. You know what you need to do. Like, comment, share this around, subscribe to the channel. Stay tuned for all of the awesome things coming out of Rise because we're only just getting started. Thank you so much for being here watching another video. Much love, take care, and follow me to Rise Higher.